Uh, what goes on inside the mind of a criminal? Is there a method to the madness and can understanding their profile really lead to solving cases? Interesting stuff. Criminal investigator Mike King is unpacking the stories of infamous minds in a bid to help law enforcement across the US and Australia. And he now joins us this morning from Utah. Good morning, Mike. Great to see you. How do you build the profile of a criminal? Oh, you know, it's, it's crazy. One thing that a profiler wants to do, Rebecca, is they really don't want to know all of the case information initially. What they really would prefer to do, and many times you, you come into a case long after the crime scene has been cleaned up, but you want to come into a room and just sit in a corner and, and stare at a wall and kind of vicariously roll in the dirt and try to experience what the emotions were that were going on. What was motivating the offender? What the victim was experiencing. And as you do that, you start to come up with ideas about what really happened. It's not voodoo witch magic. It's just kind of a process of criminal investigative analysis that looks at things very systematically. So we start with victimology. We look at the crime scenes. We look at suspectology or this study of who the possible suspects are. And as we see behavior start to unfold, these pools of possible suspects start to become more probable and help us direct the case. And a fair bit of intuition in there as well, obviously. How important is um, mapping technology and, and, and what can you do with that? You know, it really is the emerging science that has not been applied enough. If you look back in time, you know, there were pin maps in many of the police departments where they systematically stuck a pin in the wall and said something happened here. It's really important, though, to understand that everything is a dot on the map, whether it's the location where someone steals a piece of property to the location where they might turn around and pawn it at a pawn shop or the place where a body might be disposed after a violent crime everything is a location on a map and so as we bring all of that together and start to analyze why is this point on the map important to this point mm. on the map all of a sudden it starts to really help us solve a lot of problems mm. mike one of the most pivotal moments in your career was investigating the infamous zion cult what similarities can be drawn with australia's cult the family I'll tell you, I studied that cult and Ann Byrne Hamilton uh, extensively. I met with the investigators who handled that case. And uh, as Lex DeMann and I uh, chat on a regular basis, we just almost marvel at the comparisons between the two. Because as different as these cults would like to think they are, they are so very much the same when it comes to recruitment processes, to the way in which they control the membership, the way they suck people dry of all of the resources. And it's always to benefit the leader. Mm. And you think about organized religion, it's about a bigger thing of helping help uh, in humanity. But in these cults, it's all about the leader. Let's talk about this podcast, Mapping Evil. You, you also took a closer look at the 1967 Australian cold case murder of Mima McKim Hill. What did you learn from that? You know, we've looked at a number of cases, but Mima's was so intriguing to me because what it really does is it helps us recognize that there are literally multiple crime scenes involved in these cases. You have what we call the initial contact spot, that place where the offender and Mima came into contact with each other. And why did it happen? And, and who was aware that it was happening? And then you have the actual crime scene where the assault occurs or the, or the murder of Mima. And then we have what we call a disposal site, the place in which the body is finally dumped in the case of a homicide like this. But each of them are significant in the way that they are selected and the, in the environment that they're in. So it starts to tell us more about the offender. And then we look at all of that as one big whole, and it helps us to start to get a better picture again, going back to this idea of possibilities versus probabilities when we're looking at people. Mm. It's absolutely fascinating, Mike. But how can your, how can your findings, or do they empower the everyday person? You know, I constantly talk about risk assessment and risk minimization. And if we think of things like we have a, a, a process that we call the victim risk continuum, where we talk about how statistically um, certain kinds of victims fall prey to certain kinds of predators. What it really teaches us and the thing that we can empower in our own lives 
is that if we seriously think about decisions we're making, should I leave the classroom at the university at 10 o'clock at night when it's pitch black alone, or should I walk with somebody? Should I open the door to a stranger that I don't know or let them into my home because they say, hey, I need to make a phone call or I'm really thirsty and I need a glass of water? We can really reduce our victimization by looking at what kind of risk we're going to take by decisions that we're making. So in conclusion, can getting in the head of a criminal, once we know they're a criminal, help us spot one in the future? You know, it's really interesting because I think criminal behavior is very consistent. I think um, that we can learn from the criminal. We can learn how to reduce our own levels of risk. We can we know that we can do things through this idea of uh, having environmental design to make our homes less attractive to a criminal by having lighting and cameras and other things. So I think the answer, quite frankly, is absolutely. We can do more to minimize the risk of us becoming victimized. And Mark, one last one for you this morning. Do you find um, criminals are smart? Well, these types of criminals are smart, the ones that you've looked at? Some of them are so intelligent and it is like the biggest chess match yeah. to interview a serial killer and try to get them to the point that they actually make sometimes not confessions but at least omissions and commissions of information that we can really um, take advantage of so yeah they're incredibly smart but but law enforcement has the tool sets and i think when you're backed up by physical evidence and eyewitness accounts and other things that it's very uh, very probable that you can get more more uh, confessions and more convictions out of these guys it's fascinating stuff. Thank you for your time, Mike. We really <laughs> no, appreciate thank it. Thank you.